بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله استعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا من يهده لا فلا مضل ومن يضلل فلا هادي واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له عز وجل واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم ارسل الله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعه من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يسيه ما فإن لا يضر إلا نفسه ولا يضر لها شيئا أما باء فقال الله تعالى في القرآن القريب في سورة آل عمران بسم الله وَلَا تَقُومُ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ وَأَيْدًا كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وتؤمنون بالله ولو امن اكل الكتاب لكان خيرا لهم منهم المؤمنون واكثرهم الفاسقون وصلك الله عليه بارك الله لي ولكم في القران الكريم ونفعني واياكم بالذكر الحكيم انه هو جواد رؤوف رحيم الآن حي الترجم I seek refuge in Allah from Satan, from Shaitan, the accursed devil. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, all praise is due to Allah, all gratitude is due to Allah. I seek his help and beg his forgiveness, and we seek refuge in Allah from the mischief and the evil of our souls. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none who can lead that person astray, and whomsoever Allah finds in error, there is none to guide them. I bear witness that there is no God, no deity worthy of worship, and therefore existing other than Allah, who is one, alone, and unique, without partner or associate. And I bear witness further that Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him is Allah's servant, messenger and apostle. And he Allah has sent his messenger in truth and with the truth as a bearer of glad tidings and also as a warner in advance of the hour of judgment. Therefore whomsoever obeys Allah and his messenger surely that person is rightly guided. and whomsoever disobeys the two of them surely that person harms only his or her own soul and they harm not Allah the slightest little bit as for what follows for Allah glory be to him has uh, said in the Quran two verses from surah ali imran the third surah of the Quran beginning at the 100 and fourth ayah or verse Allah says let there arise out of you an ummah a nation community of people inviting to all that is good commanding what is right and forbidding what is wrong they are the ones to attain success And further Allah has said you're the best of people who evolved for mankind commanding what is right forbidding what is wrong and believing in Allah If only the people of the book had faith it would be best for them 
Among them are some who have faith, but most of them are perverted transgressors. And surely Allah tabarakah wa ta'ala, glorified and exalted be he, has spoken the truth. O oh, you who worship Allah, I want to continue to encourage us to look at the world around us, to look at current events, local events, statewide events, national events, global events, and to do so in light of the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us, to mankind, through his speech, through the Quran, and through the Sunnah or prophetic tradition of Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah to whom the Quran was revealed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. We always look to the Quran for guidance, or we should look to the Quran for guidance. And in saying that, I'm reminded of something that I used to hear Mu'allimi Sheikh Alama Tawfiq Rahmatullah say decades ago, literally decades ago. He would say to those of us who were his students that when we wake up in the morning, that the first thing that we do is look at a clock. It might be a wristwatch, it might be a cell phone, it might be a clock on the stand by your bed. But once we look at that clock, then we are able to make a determination as to what we have to do based on what time it is. So-and-so time, time for me to get up. So-and-so time, I got a few minutes, let me lay back down. Time for prayer, time for work. Once we determine the time, then we know what we have to do. And we use a device for measuring time, for determining time. And so what I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that it is time for you and I to be mature enough in our religious understanding to be able to use the Quran and the Sunnah as a timepiece. To be able to look at the Quran and to look at the Sunnah and use those as devices for measuring what's going on around us and what it is that we have to do. I was thinking this morning after Fajr about the importance or the power of narrative. The power of narrative. How important it is to have a narrative that explains in context events. Because people understand and absorb according to the narrative that predominates in their minds. The story, the history, the explanation. Here's a case in point. Today, according to reports online, releases by law enforcement, etc. Today and tomorrow, 
masjids, mosques. Not so much in New York, the one upstate New York. And then in different parts of the country, the Midwest and what have you, have been targeted by white supremacist shayateen who intend to gather outside of these mosques and in states where the law allows open carrying of weapons, of firearms, and most of the targeted masjids are in these states, these white supremacist devils intend to gather outside of these mosques with their guns visible, and uh, during the time of worship, like today is Friday, during Jummah, and according to the releases, they've stated that they will be carrying weapons and that there is a possibility, if not a likelihood, that as they are demonstrating against Islam and against the Muslims, they've said that there's a possibility that there will be a, a desecration of the Quran and a, a slaying and brandishing of pigs of swine. This is all in the news. And uh, as I became aware of this during the week, I was looking at releases from Muslims. Muslims sending out releases and notices, uh, making recommendations as to how the Muslims should deal with this type of intimidation and threat, uh, self-described by the demons as provocative. In other words, their, their object is to provoke the Muslim. And as I looked at these, and then the NYPD, NYPD put out a, um, a release in response to inquiries here in New York. Uh, what should we do? These are Muslims. What should we do if they show up here? And I said to myself, these Muslims are victims of a narrative. A narrative that is designed to disempower them, to make it uh, what is the word? To make it uh, psychologically difficult for them to do what people naturally do in similar situations. What are you talking about, Imam Talib? Well, I asked myself if Muslims live in a state where it's legal to own weapons and firearms and to carry them in public, and people stand outside of their house of worship to threaten and intimidate them and insult their religion and prov provoke them, then wouldn't it be logical for the Muslims to pick up their legal weapons and to stand in front of the masjid and simply say, no, y'all not going to be intimidating my family coming in here. You're, you're, you're not going to be standing in front of this particular house of God with a threatening 
countenance or image, you take that kind of action, then we're going to take an action. And if you're smart, you better go get the police or somebody to protect you. Because if you transgress, we will respond. Not only is that Islamic, Allah said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when you pray, let those who are with you pray and let others of you pick up their weapons and stand and watch. It's right in the Quran. And then when you have finished praying, let those who are with you step to the back and let those who are watching your back step forward and make their prayers while the others watch. This is Quranic. Not only is this Quranic, it's also international law, you know, self-defense. Yeah. Self-defense is the international law. And it is very American. Very American. And so I, I, I said to myself, what kind of narrative predominates in the minds of too many of our Muslim brothers and sisters? But I, now I'm going to say Muslim brothers because it would be a shame for the sisters to have to be the ones to do that, while the men stand in the back being protected. So no, I'm talking to the brother. What kind of narrative predominates in the psychology of these Muslims that they don't understand that that's how you're supposed to respond? And then let the police set up the barricades and tell them, no, 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 we don't want any problem. Y'all stay over there. The Muslims, you stay over here. And uh, 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 you white supremacist demons, don't go across that line. And the Muslims, you know what I mean, don't y'all go across that line. And don't, vote, don't anyone start any mess and there won't be any mess. You know what I mean? Or, or while the Muslims while the Muslims have their cameras rolling, this is how these demons oppose Islam. Look at them. Look at how, the, you know, the, and, and, and having their own signs, the demons hold up a sign that says, bearing arms is a constitutional right. And the Muslims should hold up signs and say, it certainly is. What's the problem? Because make no mistake, there are some Muslims who, who have a different narrative in their head. And if some mischief makers show up, they're going to get a different kind of response from the Muslims, from these Muslims, from us Muslims. And I'm not saying that, you know, to do anything but say what is. Oh, you who worship Allah. There's two different narratives in America as to how people struggle for freedom or have struggled for freedom. I'm not from New York. I'm from the South. I'm from the South and I'm from the uh, uh, city in the South where the sit-in movements started way back when. I'm from Greensboro, North Carolina, where a group of college students ignited a movement 
designed to end American apartheid order in the South and did it nonviolently, but did it with resistance. That's, that's, that's where I'm from. That's what was going on in the background when I was a little boy. <coughs> and then the American narrative, the approved American narrative, says that there were bus boycotts and, and uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And, and black people being beat in the head and, and not resisting and all of that type of thing. And that's how we got where we are. That, that's, that's the narrative. But that's only one narrative. And the popular and accepted narrative doesn't show other people, other African Americans, in the background saying, all right, that's how you want to do it? Fine, we respect you. But that's not how we going to do it. And if they transgress too much against you and break your line of defense, then here we are. And we're not going to be singing and marching and demonstrating. This is American history, man. This, this, this is American history as exemplified, as exemplified by the public statements of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Al-Hajj Malik al-Shabazz Malcolm X, Rahmatullahi. Well, Malcolm X said, all right. And he's not speaking as an individual. He's speaking with an army standing behind him. He said, all right. That's how they want to do it? Fine. But don't come across that line. Because if you do, there will be a response. And I don't know if we know the history. But when Dr. King had his home firebombed, you know, they firebombed his house one night, his first response was he went and got a rifle. See, they, they don't usually show that one. And he had to have a conversation with himself and a conversation with his followers because all his followers went and got rifles also. They, they went and got, got their arms. They said, well, we've been exercising one constitutional right. Now it's time for us to exercise another. And after he talked himself down, then he had to talk them down. Then amongst those men in the South who were not followers of his, they said, well, if you want to stand down, y'all go ahead and stand down. But while you standing down, we're going to stand up. And so... The two of them operating in very different ways, following two very different kinds of understanding, engaged in actions to help forward the cause of freedom in America. Now, you may ask yourself, so Imam Tal, why, why did you take... Uh, the time to say that. Well, for one thing, I took the time to say it because you don't hear it being said enough. Certainly not from the member. And two, because many of our Muslim brothers from other lands who have come to live in America, they only know about one narrative. They only know about the, you, you know, the, 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 the civil rights narrative. They only know about the narrative that says when they stand outside of your house of worship, brandishing guns 
and threaten and intimidating your sons and daughters and family, then you intimidate them. They, they, they don't know about that narrative. They only know about the one that says, oh, here they are, call the police. And can y'all come and protect us, please? Oh, you who worship Allah. So I started off reading two ayahs from the Quran. The first ayah from the Quran is one in which Allah, glory be to him, describes a process of a nation or an ummah coming into existence. When he says, let there arise out of you. Let there come out of you. Let there stand up from amongst your midst. An ummah, a nation of people, a group of people, a community of people. And then let them do what? A group of people who does what? Who yad'una ila khair wa ya'maruna bil ma'ruf. A group of people, let there stand up from you, a group of people who invites to the Kaya, invites to that which is good, and the Kaya is Islam, invites uh, humanity to the good, commands what is right, and I hope you, anytime you see in the Quran the word command, uh, translated command, uh, from Amara to order or uh, enjoin, that that's a word that presupposes authority. Authority. Oh, uh, people only give orders who have authority. So uh, uh, let there stand up from amongst you a group of people having authority, even if they have to assume the authority, you understand? You might, you might be in a situation where you have to assume authority. Because the people in authority are not operating in your interests. Case in point. Decades ago, this neighborhood used to be crime central. Crime central. You come walking down St. Nicholas Avenue, you better not walk, you better be in a tank because of the drugs and the crime and this building was crime headquarters for the neighborhood. It was abandoned, filled with drug addicts and criminals and people, they were snatching people up off of the street and dragging them in doorways right downstairs and as we say, yoking them, you, 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 you know, choking them and robbing them and kicking their behind and throwing them back out on the street. So a group of Muslims looking for a home, for a, a place to worship a law, said, oh, look at this. This is an abandoned building for sale. Let's put our money together and let's buy it. And they bought it. And then once it was bought, they said, no police around here anywhere. Therefore, we assume the authority to protect what is ours. And they we painted the sidewalk green. What do you think, that sidewalk is green just for decoration? We painted the sidewalk green, not to disrespect anyone, but simply to announce assumption of authority, and meaning responsibility. No, this is not like the other places there. You're going to do that? Go over there where nobody's taking a, a responsibility. 
us here, we take responsibility and declare what was permissible and what was not permissible on this corner. And then, one summer, I think it was, if I remember correctly, Imam Siraj Wahaj came here to visit. We were having a street festival. We invited, yeah, Imam Siraj, come speak. This is, I'm talking now, this is around 1978. Imam Siraj was a imam under the leadership and guidance of Imam Warisuddin Muhammad, rahmatullah alayhi. And I had met Imam Siraj out in Brooklyn somewhere, so I invited him to come, so he came. He looked around and he said, why is the sidewalk painted green? I told him why. He said, I like that. They went back, they painted the sidewalk outside of Masjid al -Taqwa. And then when things became intolerable in the area, they went to the NYPD and they said, uh, we getting ready to shut this area down from its haram activity that's impacting everybody that's coming to our house of worship. Uh, we'd like to give you the opportunity to partner with us in that. But whether you partner with us or not, we intend to do this. NYPD said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, let's partner. Mom Siraj came back to the Muslims. He didn't leave it to Masha the Taqwa. See, I'm also correcting a narrative that exists as to how all that happened. He came to all the rest of us. He said, listen, we're getting ready to do something we cannot do alone. We need for you brothers to stand with us in ranks for the sake of Islam. And we said, we're down. So there are Muslims from masjids all over New York City came I remember we had a big rally. Then we set up a 40-day campaign. And the Muslims went to every crack house on and around Fulton Street. And those of us who know, there was a whole lot of them. And the Muslims would walk up, say to the NYPD, that's the crack house, and stand back. NYPD would kick in the door. Arrest who was ever in there, shut down the apartment or the building, the Muslims would take post. They said, all right, we got this. Ain't nobody coming back up in here. Not for that. That's how that area got cleaned out. That's why when you walk now on Fulton Street in the area of, you know, Bedford and Fulton, you see all these Muslim businesses and no drug activity on that block or the, around the corner even because a group of Muslims got together and followed what Allah said. They got themselves together and they exercised authority to enjoin the right and forbid what is wrong and as a result of that they attained a degree of success. is still attaining degrees of success, O you who worship Allah. I took the time to say this because it's important that we as Muslims question, so what, what narrative are we following now? What is the predominant narrative in America amongst Muslims as to how you conduct yourself in this land in order to make progress? It's a very important question. 
Very important question. Oh, you who believe. As Muslims, we have been given, uh, how shall I say this, a challenge and instruction from Allah. It is a challenge and an instruction that he gave to our father and our father has passed it on to us. And when I say our father, I'm speaking of a Nebi Ibrahim, the prophet Abraham, the Khalil, the intimate friend of Allah. Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, the one to whom Allah gave commands. And when Abraham obeyed the commands of Almighty God and did so faithfully, Allah rewarded him and is still rewarding him. And those of us who are the Muslims, we are following an Abrahamic imperative past the Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. An Abrahamic imperative of Tawheed, of the worship of Allah in his oneness. There's an imperative there. How do you establish and practice the, um, uh, the worship of Allah and Allah alone in a society filled with false gods? In a society in which people by the thousands and maybe millions are practicing false worship. And when I say false worship, I mean, listen, we live in a society in which material power is a god. We live in a, a society where mammon is worshiped, you know, you know like, in the Bible, it says that Isa ibn Mariam, Jesus the son of Mary, Ali, Salam, said to the Bani Israel, he said, you can't worship Allah and mammon, he says. Every Christian knows this. In their Bible, it says, you cannot worship God and mammon. So back when I was a youngster, I read that. I said, who is this mammon? What is this? You know what I mean? So I went and I asked my mother, Mom, I'm reading the Bible here. What is it, Mammon? And she responded to me as she always responded to me whenever I would come to her with a question about the meaning of a word. My mother never told me anything. Her response was always, go look it up. Yeah, well, lie. She always told me, go look it up. Here's a dictionary. Look it up. I'm still looking it up. You know, because that's how she trained my mind. Uh, my mother was a school teacher. She, you know, she was like, no, 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 look this up. Learn to research and investigate. So I did the investigation. Found out that Mammon was a god, a false god, a, 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 de a deity worshipped by the ancient Babylonians or somebody. And it was a god of material wealth. So Jesus was said to his people, he said, man, you can't fear Allah as an imperative and bow before the dollar or whatever they were using for money back then. But we live in a society in which the dollar is placed in value over even human life. So they worship mammon. Not to mention all the other things. I mean, people are just crazy in America, man. 
wish uh, Allah has said in the Quran, uh, do you, have you not seen those who take their own hawa, their own uh, hawa, their own uh, passion or impulse as their God? This is Allah speaking in the Quran. Are you kidding? We live in a society in which passion and impulse predominates, has constitutional backing. <laughs> you, 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 you understand? So we are surrounded, us and the people of the book, of this day and time, surrounded by false worship. Many of us, in spite of our declaration of la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, engage in false worship. They are gods of intoxication. Gods, I, I, I mean, I could just start going down the list. That might make a good little book for me to write. False gods in the 20, in 21st century America, if not elsewhere. So how then do we, as Muslims, standing on a platform or a foundation of worship only of the one true God, worship only of the creator of the heavens and the earth, so that how does that translate into how we live our lives? This is the question. How does that, so maybe that means that you're supposed to be a leader in the society and not a follower. Maybe that presupposes a certain amount of sacrifice as Abraham sacrificed in order to establish this way of thinking and pass it on to our children. Maybe that means if you have young children and you understand that from the uh, body of humanity, Allah is calling a people to step forward with authority and to pursue the maruf and to leave behind the munkar to to pursue that which has been righteously commanded and leave behind that which has been righteously forbidden, maybe if that's what you're about and that's what you, your children are about, then maybe you don't put your young children in public school. Because they're not going to learn that in public school. Or if you do put your children in public school, Maybe that means you say, well, I better get in here as a parent and be involved in everything. I'm watching everybody. I'm watching the books. I'm on the school board. I'm in leadership. There's a parent, uh, I forget what state it was, African-American parent, who got a text message from one of her public school children. It said, Ma, look at what's in our history book. And in the history book, there was a description of slavery that did not mention the word slavery and said, well, in late 18th century, early 19th century America, millions of workers were imported from Africa in order to bolster, the, I mean, some of those stuff like that. The mother said, oh, no, you don't. I mean, imagine this. And as some intelligent person said, in order for that to be in a textbook, not only does somebody have to write some, the editors, the, everybody who's in the line of people looking at this before it gets published said, well, yeah, just let that go. And that's good. So the mother went on social media and organized the campaign and now the book company has retracted that. They pull in the books. They said, no, we, we're going to call it a slavery. We're going to call it what it was. 
You know, you know what I mean? And 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 we should be doing better than that. This this is the uh, okay. But had not that parent or somebody else like her watching the development of her child said, no, no, this is not what's going to happen. So why is that important? That's important because every Muslim with a child in public school, that's how you're supposed to be. Watching anybody, everything, in positions of leadership and monitoring. And then there are others, <laughs> there are others who would just make the sacrifices necessary and build their own school. They say, well, no, I mean, uh, that's where you get the national school system. Do you know that there's a national Muslim school system that exists? Called the Clara Muhammad School. All over America, right? Schools built and uh, uh, maintained through great struggle, I might add, by Muslims. And when you go up in there, you don't just see African-American children sitting in there, not in this day and time. At one time you did, only. But now you go in there, you see Muslim children of different ethnicities. Why are they there? And I mention them because it's a, a, a nationwide system. Uh-huh. Why are they there? They're there because their parents want to make sure that their children are raised with a certain psychology, and hopefully that indicates that they are also willing to do at home, at home, that which is necessary to raise up this child, understanding that he or she is special. You are special. We are here, and this and that predominates, but that's not for you, because you are special, because Allah has called us away from all of that in the way that we believe and the way that we live our lives. Oh, you who worship Allah, I want to think about this, will you please? Think about this and ask yourself, what is the predominant narrative running in my mind and in my life as a Muslim in America? And should I be following that narrative or should I be following a different narrative based upon what I believe? And may Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala guide us aright. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم وبعد فقال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم في سورة بقرة بسم الله وإذ صلى إبراهيم ربهم بكلمات فأتمهن قال إني جائلك للناس إماما جائلك للناس إماما قال ومن ذريتي قال لا ينال أحد الظالمين وصدق الله العظيم اللهم اغفر لنا مسلمين ومسلمات ومؤمنين ومؤمنات ومحسنين ومحسنات وبع او you who worship Allah for Allah has said and remember that Abraham was tried by his lord with certain commands which he fulfilled he said i will make you an imam to the nation meaning he, Allah, said, I will make you, Abraham, an imam to the nations. He, Abraham, pleaded, 
and also imams from my offspring. Offspring. He, Allah, answered, but my promise is not within the reach of the Zalimi, not within the reach of evildoers. Or you worship Allah. That's what I want to end on. Make one point, and then we're going to end, and then I'm going to come back, inshallah, next week and pick up where I'm stopping. Two weeks ago, same week that uh, Pope Francis was here in New York and all of the uh, pomp and circumstance surrounding him was occurring. The United Nations General, As General Assembly was meeting at that time. They meet every September, right downtown. Uh, Pope Francis addressed the United Nations General Assembly, which is something he had a, 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 a right to do as a sovereign leader. And once Pope Francis left town, at the UN, they kind of got back to, you know, the other business that they had come there for. So one day, the representative of Palestine got up. I mean, there were a lot of people getting up. The president of Iran, he got up and denounced the death of the pilgrims uh, during the Hajj, you know, during the Hajj stampede. And, you know, that occurred over there. May Allah have mercy on all those people and reward them with Jannah. I mean. So, you know, at first when the stampede occurred, if you, if you read the official government statements, one government official blamed the stampede on Africans. I mean, these are official statements now, you know. He made that, and there was such a backlash against him, he retracted what he said. Then another government official said, well, it's a tragedy, but, you know, mashallah, things happen. You know, just like these people that were just killed at the school, and they asked one of the presidential candidates, I think it was Jeb Bush. So what do you think about this? Eh, stuff happens, he said. You know, wh which is a way of meaning nobody going to take responsibility for this here. Because if you're going to take responsibility, some actions have to be taken. So that during the General Assembly, the president of Iran said, oh, no, you don't, man. Saudi government, y'all going to have to take some responsibility for this here, man. We're not going to let you just wave it off. That's, that happened one day. We can understand that. But what I really wanted to mention is one day the, the, the representative of the Palestinian government got up. And he said in so many words, you know what? We're tired of running around and around in a circle with this situation here with the oppression of the Palestinian people, while the heads of government in Israel continue to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, and how they want to do it, we're not going for this anymore. Started a whole, it's <laughs> still going on. But in essence, that's, that's what he said. When I looked at his statement, my mind went back. You know, when you start getting older, you, know, you start, you know, you start having something that happens and it triggers memories. So I saw in my mind's eye, I remember one day there was a full page ad in the New York Times. You know, when you see somebody with a full page advertisement in the New York Times, 
That's you talk about big money. I mean, I remember way back when it used to cost ten grand. I don't know what it costs now. Ten thousand, you know. I remember a full page ad in the New York Times that had been put there by this group of rabbis, conservative rabbis. And they quoted uh, from the uh, book of Genesis about Abraham and his inheritance. And they said, in essence, this is our land. And we're not going to let anybody run us away from this land, and we're going to be in charge. Here. That's uh, you know I'm summarizing. I remember that four-page ad, which I might still have folded up inside one of my books somewhere. So I, I remember that because you now when this occurred, we were just coming out of Iloadha, all right. And I said to myself, that's a false narrative. There's a narrative there. There's a narrative behind all of that. I'm talking about a narrative from scripture, a narrative from religion that runs underneath that whole conflict. And this being a very political world, people are always talking about the political narrative, which needs to be talked about. It needs to be talked about the political narrative, but there's a, a narrative of scripture that centers on Prophet Abraham, and Nebi Ibrahim, which I will summarize by saying that as the result of his devout obedience to Almighty God, Almighty Allah, Allah made a promise to him. He prom and the promise was uh, physical, had a physical dimension and a spiritual dimension. The physical dimension was a territorial promise where he said, Allah said to Abraham that this area here, and he specifies the area, you know how specific Allah can be, he specifies the area as what we call a holy land. Said this will be under the jurisdiction, under the authority of your your offspring, of your children. That was physical, and then spiritually, socially, he said, "And I will make your children." What we just heard from the Quran, I will make your children imams to the nation. And again, speaking biblically, uh, that's symbolized, as it says in the book of Genesis, it says Abraham was standing in the desert and Allah spoke to him and told him, look down underneath your feet. And he looked down, of course, all he saw was sand, a lot of sand in the desert. So then look above your head. He looked up in the sky, it was a night sky, and the night sky was filled with stars. And that scripture says that uh, Allah said to Abraham, your progeny are going to be as numerous as the grains of sand under your feet and the stars over your head. You know, you know, meaning your physical progeny, you understand? Physical progeny and your spiritual progeny. So we have going on right now Right now, in the Holy Land, a conflict of tremendous proportion. So much so it has global uh, implications. With one group of people claiming authority based on a falsehood, on a lie, and one group claiming it based on the truth. One group, the group who is, you know, making a claim based on truth, they are for sure physical progeny of Abraham. The Arabs, the Arabs are Abraham's descendant through his son Ismail, and their mother, mother Hajar. That's who they are. 
So they said, well, no, man. They said, yeah, man, and this is my daddy left me this land, man. Then there's another group claiming, claiming authority. Oh, well, my daddy left me this too. No, he didn't. That ain't your daddy. Not genetically, anyway. You from the Caucasus Mountains somewhere up in Europe, man. You're, you're, you're not, and, and we know who our cousins are because our cousins have been living here as long as we've been living here and we didn't have any problem with them. The problem only started when you came here from someplace else. Don't be claiming your, Allah says in the Quran, don't claim children as your biological children who are not yours or you who worship Allah. So I want you to think about this. I'm going to wrap it up right now. I'm looking at the clock, time to stop. I mention it because we have an inheritance. Every Muslim has an inheritance that is due us based upon a narrative of truth, not a narrative of falsehood. But none of us should think that success is going to be guaranteed to us in America just based upon, you know what I mean, who you descended from and all of that kind of stuff. You're going to have to do more than that. It's going to have to be about more than that. Allah said, even talking to Abraham, he said, all right. He said, Abraham did what every parent does. I want my children to do well. Make my children successful. I said, all right, but the far sikun, wrongdoers, evildoers, they, this is not for them. This is not for them. This is only for those who are upright. Those who are going to do what's right. Believe what is right. Speak what is right. And live what is right. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us aright. I'm reaching, trying to encourage us to think on a higher level as every Muslim leader should be doing and to conceive our lives as Muslims beyond just our individual life. This is not just about you or you and your one child. Yeah, it is about you. It is about you and your child, but even more so, it's about us. And it's about all of our children. And it's about us as a people, a Muslim people, who have an inheritance, who have a legacy passed to us from our father. And so we ask Allah to make us true in thinking, true in understanding, and true in behavior. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Ameen wa alqa ikamah.